O oh Lord, I pray to thee in this my time of need and beg for the power and ability, the power to entertain these masses, the power to give them the cleric guide they need, nay, the cleric guide they deserve. I pray for the righteous, holy power to make them smash that like button. Oh, great and mighty algorithm, grant me the power in the name of the like, the subscribe, and the holy comment. Howdy! My name is Nonat, and finally, after literally two months of delay, it's time for the Cleric Deep Dive. If this is your first time checking out one of these class deep dive videos, which, with all the new subscribers we have hanging around here, it's not unlikely, uh, we go over everything. This video is usually going to be about 45 minutes to an hour long, going over all of the proficiencies, class features, and feats available to these classes. Now. This is a spell casting class, which means the class features will be shorter, but I won't be going over the spells in this video. That is something completely separate, which I've touched on like six months ago. I had a series going that kind of fell off because it wasn't doing that well, but maybe I'll bring it back someday. But let's stop rambling. You know, I already asked you to like and subscribe in the intro, so if you didn't, <laughs> I mean, come on. Do you really want to be one of these people? But jumping right in, we can see the Cleric is obviously a Wisdom-based caster with 8 hit points per level, a little higher than your standard caster. Starting off only trained and everything but will, you know, they're, they're still fragile, they're still a caster, but they do have the ability to fight alongside a martial class if they really try hard enough. Uh, they start trained in religion, as well as a bonus skill determined by their choice of deity. Similar to the spells, I won't be going over all of the different Pathfinder deities, as with all of the supplement books, there's a ton of them out there, and that should be its own video in the future. You also get two plus your intelligence modifier and bonus skills. By default, clerics are only trained in simple weapons, but depending on your deity, you might get access to some martial weapons, because you're automatically trained in your deity's favored weapon. So even if you're just a cleric, if your deity's favored weapon is the Great Axe, you can use it. The big weakness is that by default, clerics are completely untrained in armor. Though, as we'll see soon, of the two subclasses, that's right, they only have two subclasses, one of them does grant training in armor. So similar to the champion, a lot of the cleric's starting class features are very flavor-focused. They give a few things here and there, an extra spell, an extra ability or two, but it's a lot of flavor depending on the deity you pick. Your deity determines what your character believes in and what they are supposed to do and what they are not supposed to do. And these are the exact same deities the champions can pick from. Both a cleric and champion of Saren Ray follow the same morals, you know, give people the opportunity for redemption and don't, you know, let people be free and make their own choices, you know? Just like a champion, all cleric deities come with an anathema and if you commit said anathema, you lose all of your cleric class features until you perform a redemption ritual. Clerics cast spells from the divine spell list, so they're a little more support focused, but they do have some offensive choices here and there. They begin with five cantrips and two first level spells per day. The cleric is the first prepared spellcaster we've actually gone over here in one of these deep dives. This means they have a wider array of spells to choose from, but they need to individually pick their spells every day. If you want to be able to cast heal two times that day, you need to prepare it in both spell slots. And if you've prepared heal in both of your spell slots, you can't prepare anything else. The upside for this restriction, other than the wider array of spells known, is their ability to heighten spells at will. Unlike a spontaneous caster like the Oracle we talked about a few weeks back, a prepared caster, once they know a spell, they can heighten it to any slot they have. So the Cleric can heighten their heal spell the second they get access to second level, third level spell slots, they can automatically prepare heal in those spell slots, whereas an oracle, a divine caster who's spontaneous, would have to spend one of their new spells on learning heal level 3. And cantrips work the same for every caster. They're automatically heightened up to half your level, rounded up, so every odd level your cantrips get a little bit stronger. The first thing that makes the cleric really start to stand out, and probably my favorite feature of the cleric, is their divine font. Every deity in the game has either a healing or harming divine font. This font grants the cleric additional spell slots every single day 
equal to one plus their charisma modifier, meaning that a high charisma on a cleric is incredibly powerful. What this means is that if your cleric has a 16 in charisma at level one, well, if you have the healing font, you get four extra spell slots every single day. The only restriction on these is that if it's a healing font, they can only be used on the heal spell. If it's a harmful font, it can only be used on the harm spell. An amazing thing about this, though, is that these are always heightened to the strongest level of spell you can cast. So the second a cleric hits level 5, then boom, they get 4 additional level 3 spell slots that they can only spend on heal. But this does mean that if you have a harmful font deity, you can be a very effective damage dealer as a cleric. Compare a wizard who gets two first level spell slots and then cantrips at first level to a cleric at first level who gets two first level spell slots, if you have a harmful font, four additional offensive spells, and then their cantrips. It's fantastic what a cleric can do at low levels. And then we come to the subclasses, also known as the cleric doctrines. Unfortunately, even with all of the supplements we've gotten so far, there's still only two subclasses for the cleric. Hopefully when Gods and Magic comes out, we'll see at least a third one. We have the Cloistered Cleric, who is your classic man of the cloth. You know, they preach, they spread the word of their beliefs, and they cast magic. Every so many levels, a cleric gains a new feature from their doctrine, which means a Cloistered Cleric and the other cleric, the War Priest, actually level up very differently. The Cloistered Cleric at level 1 gains the Domain Initiate Cleric feat, which we'll be going over later. At 3rd level, gain Expert in Fortitude saves. 7th level, their proficiency in spell attacks and DCs increases to Expert. At 11th level, they gain Expert proficiency with their favored weapon, as well as Crit Specialization. 15th level is Master Spellcasting, and 19th level is Legendary Spellcasting. So obviously it's pretty clear the Cloistered Cleric is designed for spellcasting, so the War Priest is designed for... What else? Combat. Physical combat, to be specific. At first level, if you take the War Priest, you immediately become trained in light and medium armor, your fortitude saves instantly go up to expert, and you gain the shield block general feat. You get very similar to a fighter with all of this. Additionally, you gain deadly simplicity, the cleric feat, right away, which basically just means you do more damage with simple weapons, especially if they're your god's favorite weapon. Additionally, with this first doctrine, upon reaching 13th level, your armor proficiency goes up to expert. Unfortunately, the third level second doctrine for the War Priest, 9 times out of 10, is probably going to be pretty useless. Likely, if you're going to be using a martial weapon, it's going to be your deity's favorite weapon. You know, if your deity's favorite weapon is a greatsword, you can already use it from level 1. But at third level, you become trained in all martial weapons. So if you wanted to throw a composite longbow alongside your greatsword from your deity's favorite weapon, I suppose that's helpful. At 7th level, the War Priest finally gains expert proficiency with their deity's favorite weapon only, which is unfortunate because along with that restriction on just that one weapon type, um, <laughs> that's still two levels later than all other martial classes. Champions, rogues, rangers all get expert proficiency at level 5, whereas the War Priest, a cleric dedicated to melee of co physical combat, does not gain that until 7th level. And then at 11th level, they catch up to the Cloistered Cleric with expert spellcasting DCs and attack rolls. 15th level, they increase their fortitude saves to master and auto-crit any fortitude successes. And then level 19 caps them off at master spellcasting while Cloistered gets to legendary. I have my own issues with this. I think the War Priest should have at least reached master proficiency with weapons because they're made to do stuff in battle. Sure, they get master spellcasting as well, but they, so they don't get legendary spellcasting, but they also don't get master with weapons. They're okay at both, I suppose, but especially with the way Pathfinder 2e worked with scaling armor class and stuff, attacking with just an expert weapon is gonna fall off fast. But that's all of the level 1 features for the Cleric. Being a spellcasting class, they do not even get feats. They don't get feats until 2nd level. As well as skill feats, general feats, skill increases, everybody gets this stuff. You get ability boosts at level 5, but you also get expert perception at level 5. A s decent upgrade. You get ancestry feats, of course, at level 5. And then at level 9, you get resolve, increasing your will saves to master and auto-critting any normal will save success. 
Lightning reflexes at level 11 is expert reflex save. Level 13, your armor goes up one. If you're a war priest, it also goes up for light and medium. You can see what I mean by these very simplistic class features. Most of their class features came from their doctrine. You get weapon specialization at 13th level, dealing a little bit of extra damage, and then they cap it off with no other class features outside their doctrine until level 19 with Miraculous Spell, which gives you a 10th level spell slot. And that's it. Like I've said, most spellcasters don't get a whole lot of class features, and their feats are actually pretty simple. So when I said this video is going to be like an hour, I, spellcasters are going to be a lot shorter. Martial classes actually have a lot more going on mechanically in their in their class, whereas spellcasters, you know, a lot of their mechanical depth comes from their choice of spells. But that doesn't mean they don't have some cool feats that can help augment those spells. So let's go ahead and check it out, starting with Deadly Simplicity, which if you are wielding a deity's favored weapon, and that weapon happens to be simple, you increase the damage die one step. So if you're using a 1d6 club, if you have the Deadly Simplicity feat, it's now a 1d8 club, and that counts for striking runes too. So if you have a striking club with Deadly Simplicity, it's a 2d8 weapon in your hands. Pretty solid. Next up, Domain Initiate, which the Cloistered Cleric gets for free at level 1. Uh, you get a focus pool of 1 point as well as a focus spell from any of the domains associated with your deity. If you're not aware, every deity in the game has 3 or 4 domains. You know, water, fire, family, travel, art. These are all different domains that that deity resides over, and each of those domains have spells associated with them. This allows you to take one domain spell associated with a domain associated with your deity. So if you have Shaylin as your deity, you could take the art focus spell, which you'll probably like put up here or something. But I'm not going to go into them deep here. I have a video way back in the past where I talked about these, and my position hasn't really changed. If you look at this spell... They're not that strong. You compare this to something like a wizard or sorcerer focus spell, which I'll put down here, uh, their effects are pretty minor. You can see these, these effects are not symmetrical. I can't think of them off the top of my head. I think the art domain has a couple different like fascination or different conditions it can apply. But remember, you can really only use these once per encounter. So, you know, for being a one time per encounter use, they could be stronger. Healing and Harming Hands, we'll talk about it at the same time, they do the exact same thing. If you cast the associated spell, you roll d10s instead of d8s. Not much to be said about this, it's good. What is important though is this does not increase the flat healing from heal at the 2 action version. The 2 action version of heal will usually heal for 1d8 plus 8. If you have Healing Hands, it's still only 1d10 plus 8. It does not turn that 8 into a 10. And Holy Castigation is incredibly uh, specific. You can use the heal spell to damage fiends as though they were undead. It's a cool flavor. You know, your, your heal spell is packed with so much good energy that it hurts evil creatures. But, you know, maybe only take this if you know you're going to be fighting fiends. And over in the APG for level 1 cleric feats, we have Premonition of Avoidance, which is pretty cool. It grants the cleric a reaction, which you've always heard me tell you about. Like, reactions are not automatic in Pathfinder 2e. Not everybody can take attacks of opportunity, so feats that give your class a reaction when you don't already have one are always great because it is just something extra you can do each round. Premonition of Avoidance is... If you are making a saving throw against a hazard specifically, not like an enemy spell or something, but specifically a trap, if you have not rolled it yet, you can just use your reaction to give yourself a plus two bonus to the saving throw. Pretty solid. Vile Desecration is the evil version of Holy Castigation. When you use the harm spell, you can use it to deal evil damage instead of negative damage, meaning it can harm things like Celestials for bonus damage. At level 2, we have Cantrip Expansion. You know two more cantrips. It's fine, I guess. Communal Healing is a nice little way to just up your overall numbers healed. Whenever you heal someone, you yourself regain hit points equal to the spell level of your heal. And remember, if you have a healing font, you're gonna get free spell slots every level of your highest available spell slot. So this sort of scales with you. You know, you're level 5. Every time you cast a third level heal spell, you get three hit points back yourself. It's not a lot, but it's a cool passive to keep yourself, you know, healthy. Also, this only works when you heal something else. If you cast heal on yourself, you don't get hit points equal to the spell level. Kinda lame. Emblazon Armament is one of my favorite early game feats for the Cleric. During daily preparations, you choose a shield or a weapon, and you 
enchant it. It doesn't even have to be during daily preparations. It just takes 10 minutes to do this. Then, quite literally, for the next year <laughs> of time, that item gets a permanent bonus. If it is a weapon, it deals one bonus damage to all damage rolls. And if it's a shield, its hardness goes up by one, so it reduces one extra damage every time it's used. So you can use this on your own gear, or if you're a cloistered cleric, maybe just put this on your ranger's bow or your fighter's broadsword. Emblazoned armament is cool, but you can only have one item emblazoned at a time. That's the big limitation. You can't just enchant your whole party's items. Otherwise, this would be broken. Now, there is a big restriction on this feat. The benefits are only granted if the person using the weapon is a follower of that same deity. So, chances are low, but hey, this means you could work out a cool duo with your partner. You know, if you and a friend want to make two characters who already know each other, maybe one's a champion and one's a cleric, which I think is what this is designed around, and you both worship Saren Ray, well, at every day, or I guess once per year, your cleric can just emblazon the champion's shield with the sigil of Saren Ray, granting it plus one to hardness, basically permanently, which is so cool. Worst case scenario, you enchant your own weapon to deal plus one damage, you know? Sap Life, the exact same as the heal one, but now whenever you cast the Harm spell, you restore that many hit points equal to the spell's level. Not too bad, and honestly, I think this one's a little bit better. You know, if you're going for an offensive cleric, then, you know, being able to heal and deal damage is pretty cool. Turn Undead, I'm sad to see, is not an ability in Pathfinder 2e. It is a level 2 feat, which simply augments your heal spell. Should you use the heal spell to damage an undead creature and it critically fails its fortitude save, it also becomes fleeing for one round. And this applies to all undead, so if you're standing in the middle of 10 zombies and you use the 30-foot burst version of heal, and they all critically fail, I don't know, but that means they're all going to run away. What makes me sad about this is there's no turn undead that just eradicates them, you know? I definitely miss when turn undead was its own action, separate from everything else and in the cleric's toolkit, but I guess I can understand why they did it. And versatile font allows you to spend your extra daily spell slots from your font for heal or harm, but only if your deity allows you to pick, which is unfortunately not a lot of deities. There are some, but most deities restrict it to healing or harming, it's rare you have one that does both. Level 2 in the APG grants a little bit specific but cool feat. It is a reaction, like I said before, always good. Uh, should your ally hit zero hit points, as a reaction you can immediately make a stride action to move towards that ally with a plus 10 move speed, which means if you're a cleric elf with you know, a 30 foot base, maybe you took the nimble elf feet, then that's 35 feet. If your ally goes down to zero, you can move 45 feet as a reaction in their direction, which is pretty cool. Channel Smite is the Magus without needing to be a Magus, but you can only do it with heal or harm. You channel the spell right into your weapon and make an attack roll. If you miss, you don't get the spell slot back. The spell is expended, but if you hit, it also adds the damage as negative or positive if you used heal or harm. Also, keep in mind the damage rules still work the same way. You can only hurt something that is weak to positive damage with the heal spell. You can't just hit a bandit for positive damage and expect it to hurt it. I think it'll actually heal it. In the core rulebook, evil clerics actually have a little bit of support with Command Undead. If you use the Harm spell on an undead creature after activating Command Undead, you attempt to wrench control of that mindless undead. Should they fail their fortitude save against your harm spell, it doesn't take any damage, but the undead becomes your minion for one minute, meaning it functions just like an animal companion where you sacrifice an action to give it to. If it crit fails, it obeys you for one hour. Now the downside is this only works if the undead is three levels lower than you. So if you're level one, or I guess at this point level four, it'll only work on like a level one zombie. If you're even fighting a level two or level three undead, it's not gonna work. Additionally, if the undead is being controlled by somebody, the controller also gets to roll a saving throw and the undead uses whichever result was higher between it and its controller's save. So not super great, but if you're in a horde situation where there's just tons of low level undead, it can be pretty good. 
Directed Channel, you can change the three action version of Heal or Harm. Instead of an Emanation, you can change it into a 60 foot cone, which for the Harm spell basically makes it a Dragon Breath of negative energy, which is really, really cool. Additionally, for the heal spell, this can often be better. If you angle yourself right at the edge of your party and you can hit all of them in a 60-foot cone, that's fantastic for healing. Improved communal healing is a definite upgrade to the level 2 feat. Now, when you heal someone, you don't need to give yourself the extra healing from the spell level. You can give it to anyone else within range. Additionally, you get the bonus healing when you heal yourself now, but those extra hit points need to go to someone else, not yourself. Some really big restrictions with this, but it's it's a cool way to play. You know, it just makes every heal spell you do way more efficient. Not way more, but a little more efficient. Necrotic Infusion makes me think there is some cool cleric necromancer build out there somewhere, but it would be really difficult to make it work. Necrotic Infusion is awesome. You can cast harm to heal an undead creature, and if you do, that creature gets plus 1d6 negative damage to all of its melee weapon and unarmed attacks until the end of its next turn. What kind of sucks about this is it specifically says undead, meaning if you cast this on a Dompeer ally, Dompeer are not technically undead, they just have negative healing, so they can't get this bonus damage, so you cannot give this to your Dompeer monk, which sucks. What you can do, though, weirdly in the APG, not the core rulebook, is Radiant Infusion, which is the thing we just talked about, but for positive. If you cast heal on your ally, then until the end of its next turn, all of its melee weapon and unarm strikes deal 1d6 bonus positive damage. <laughs> At 6th level, we start getting actually, like, pretty impactful, cool feats. Cast Down is one that I've actually overlooked after all these months. It is a single-action meta magic to enhance your next heal or harm spell. And if your target takes any damage at all, meaning even on a normal success, they get knocked prone. So with this, at you know, for its 3 actions total to meta magic and then 2 action cast it at 30 foot range, but you can do that and then even if they normal succeed their fortitude save against your harm spell, they are knocked prone. Additionally, should they critically fail their save, they'll take a minus 10 foot status penalty for one minute, which is kinda brutal actually. That's almost half of a normal target's movement speed just gone. Divine Weapon is basically a worse Bespell Weapon from the Wizard, which I keep referencing things like the Wizard even though we haven't talked about it yet, but for a free action, after casting anything that uses a spell slot, your weapon can deal 1d4 bonus force damage on your next attack. If you want, you can upgrade this to 1d6 damage, but it has to be aligned damage equal to the alignment of your deity. So if you're following a lawful neutral deity, you can only deal lawful damage. Or if you're chaotic good, you can deal good or chaotic damage. And just a reminder, unless the target is the polar opposite of that alignment, if you pick lawful, they have to be chaotic, they'll take no damage unless they're chaotic. Though this is a creative way to determine a creature's alignment. If you want to find out if it's evil, make your weapon deal bonus good damage and then stab them. And then if they bleed, they're evil. Selective Energy is great for the AoE version of the Harm spell. Now, with Selective Energy, when you use an Area of Effect style with your Heal or your Harm, you can designate up to your Charisma modifier plus one of targets who are not effective. So you can now remove your allies from your Harm spells or remove your enemies from your Heal spells. Very solid. And Steady Spellcasting is okay. I find it allows you to attempt a flat DC check to not get interrupted by, say, an attack of opportunity if you're doing a concentrate action, but I find that does not come up that often. First off, the target specifically needs to hit you with an attack of opportunity to interrupt you, which only happens if you're casting a spell in melee range with someone who does have this kind of attack of opportunity, and then you get a 75% chance to maintain your concentration. So it's, it's very specific if and when this comes up. It'll be good if it does, but the unfortunate thing is that all of these stars could align. You could need to cast a spell with the Concentrate trait in Attack of Opportunity range of someone who has Attack of Opportunity and that Attack of Opportunity hits you, and then you could still roll a less than a 15 and you lose your spell. 
all of this coming together for a 25% chance is not great. Magic Hands. When you make a medicine check to treat wounds, you heal the maximum amount. So if you roll the DC 15 medicine check, you instantly heal for 16. Does not matter what you roll, it's great. If you critically succeed that check, you heal for 32 hit points all the time. This is a fantastic feat, especially if you want to play a cleric in like a low magic campaign and you're, you know, you can't use your spells as often maybe. This is really, really cool. And the idea of healing medicine is awesome to me. Advanced Domain is the same as Domain Initiate, except you get the Advanced Domain spell instead of the initial one. These ones are a little bit better. Align Armament is similar to the Divine Weapon we talked about earlier. Once per round, you can spend one action to touch any weapon, it does not have to be your own, and for that round, you give it, you know, good, lawful, you give it any alignment, and then for the rest of that round, it deals 1d6 bonus damage of that alignment to creatures of the opposite alignment. Of course, there's still a restriction that the alignment must match your deity, so you will have at most two options. Also, sorry, it's not when you touch the weapon you get to choose, it's when you pick this feat you choose. So, when you pick this feat and you're chaotic good, you have to pick chaotic or good, and that is the only thing you can imbue a weapon with, unless you take this feat a second time. Channeled Sucker is fantastic. You can sacrifice one of your Divine Font heal spell slots in exchange to cast Remove Curse, Remove Disease, Remove Paralysis, or Restoration at that spell level. This is fantastic because this is not even once per day. This basically means all of your Divine Font spells are now spontaneous for one thing, and they can be used to cast any of these spells and heal. And these are still auto-heightened to your highest spell level. This is one of the strongest feats for the Cleric so far. In contrast, Cremate Undead is less good than Channeled Sucker. Uh, when you use Heal to harm an undead creature, it takes persistent damage equal to the spell's level, which is at most 4 at level 8. So you can either gain 4 more unique spells spontaneously casting with your spell slots, or inflict 4 persistent damage when you heal undead. Yup. Emblazon Energy is an upgrade to Emblazon Armament and is kind of needlessly complicated and restrictive. For example, if you want to imbue a shield with Emblazon Energy, you have to choose between the plus one hardness from Emblazon Armament or Emblazon Energy's really crazy effect, which is you choose Acid, Cold, Electricity, Fire, or Sonic. The wielder of the shield <laughs> gains a circumstance bonus to saving throws against that damage type, so if you pick Fireball, they get a bonus to saving throws uh, against Fireball. They can also use Shield Block to reduce that damage. So like I said, if you chose Fire, they get hit by a Fireball, they can actually Shield Block that Fire damage. Really cool. Now, what would have been even cooler is the second part. The Shield also gains resistance to that damage equal to half of your spell freaking caster level, the spell's level effectively. You're level 8, that gives the shield 4 resistance to fire damage, meaning, you know, you can reduce the damage of fire by a lot. But that is only if you have a domain spell with that elemental trait. Not even if your deity has that domain, but you need to have the domain spell with that trait. So it's really heavy investment for even at max level, 10 resistance to one element. Way too restrictive, Paizo, I'm sorry. <laughs> On the same vein, you can give this to a weapon to deal 1d4 bonus damage of any of those elements, and if you have a domain spell with that trait, it adds 1d6 instead of 1d4. Again, you have to grab a whole domain spell for a potential 2 extra damage. Martyr is if you need to heal for a million hit points at once. Let's say you cast Heal at 4th level on your ally. Well, you're going to heal them for 4d8, and then you will take 4d8 damage, and they restore that much more. So with this, you could effectively cast Heal at 4th level for 2 actions after upgrading it with the, the Martyr metamagic action, and then they would heal for 8d8 plus 32 and then, of course, you would take the 4d8, that whatever you rolled. So it's not a net gain in the party's hit points, but, you know, if your fighter is surrounded and you're doing fine, giving them your hit points is fantastic. This feat is really solid. 
Surging Focus is also really cool. It would be better if the Focus spells for the Cleric were a little bit stronger, though. As a free action, if you see an ally drop to zero hit points, you get a Focus Point back. That's really, really cool. And with the advanced and higher level Focus spells, this is definitely better. Though an issue I have is that the Advanced Domain Focus spell feat is the same feat level as Surging Focus, so you have to choose between getting free focus points back if an ally drops, or getting a better focus spell. It's... not well designed, these cleric feat levels. I... <laughs> Castigating Weapon is fine. If you deal damage to a fiend using a heal spell, all future melee attacks deal half of that spell's level in bonus damage to fiends. Again, this isn't that much. You know, if you are level 10, you cast heal at 5th level and hurt a fiend with it, well, your melee attacks are going to do 2 bonus good damage to fiends until the end of that turn. Sorry, end of your next turn. Now, Heroic Recovery is an awesome meta magic for your heal spell. You know, you have to spend an, an action to activate this because it's meta magic, and then anybody you heal with your heal spell gains a 5-foot bonus to their move speed, plus 1 to attack rolls, and plus 1 to damage rolls. That's huge! The downside is you cannot use this with the Emanation. You need to heal a single target for this to work, so you can't grant this to your whole party on the first round of combat, even though that would be super cool. Improved Command Undead improves Command Undead. <laughs> that was the stupidest sentence I've ever said. But it doesn't fix it in the way that unfortunately seems like it should be. Uh, this simply extends the duration of your command. If they succeed, now they are your minion for one round. If they fail, 10 minutes. If they critically fail, 24 hours. But it does not remove the minus 3 level restriction. So, unless you're fighting a level 7 undead, you can't command it. Replenishment of War is really, really cool and great for the War Priest. Whenever you land a strike with your deity's favored weapon, you gain temporary hit points equal to half your level. This is crazy. You know, at level 10, every time you successfully hit, doesn't matter how much damage you do, as long as you hit, that's five temporary hit points for one round. If you critically hit, you get your whole level. This will never not be good and very consistent temporary hit points without spending any resources. Shared Avoidance is a direct upgrade to level 1's Premonition of Avoidance, and you can now grant that plus 2 circumstance bonus against hazard saving throws to you and all allies within 15 feet who are making the same save. So if you trigger a fireball trap, well, everybody now gets that bonus. Really nice. Shield of Faith is really weird for a level 10 feat. If you cast a focus spell and consume a focus point, you get plus 1 armor class until the start of your next turn. This is not a level 10 feet, this is a level 2 feet. Come on, like it's fine, AC is great, but good lord, I don't know what build wants to take this. It's so slow and unimpactful. Through Spell is a one action meta magic that allows you to ignore cover. However, because this is a cleric feat, there are heavy restrictions. This only counts for cover provided by living and undead creatures, so if they're behind a wall, this does nothing. But if they're hiding behind a golem or a goliath, uh, not even a golem, because golems aren't alive or dead. If they're hiding behind a zombie brute for cover, you can shoot through it. That's it. Defensive recovery is pretty solid. For one action, you enhance your next heal or harm spell. And as long as a single target recovered hit points with it, it gains a plus two to armor class and saving throws for one round. You know, if your ally is really low on hit points and they need to get out of there fast, this is a great way to get them out because they get hit points and then they're way harder to hit for the next round. Really solid. Domain focus means when you refocus, you get two focus points back instead of one. Emblazon Anti-Magic is even more along the lines of Emblazon Armament. What is nice about this is Emblazon Energy is not a prerequisite. So if you don't want Emblazon Energy from the earlier levels, you can just skip it and go right to Emblazon Anti-Magic at level 12, provided you took Emblazon Armament at second level. If you Emblazon a Shield, it grants the Shield Circumstance bonus to saving throws against any kind of magic, and you can even use Shield Block against magical damage of any kind. And if you Emblazon a Weapon, on critical hits, that weapon can attempt to disrupt any spell effect on a target. I'm not sure why they made this only on critical hits, especially because when you do this, even if you fail, if you attempt to do this, the emblazon symbol disappears. It's just gone. So not only do you need to critically hit to even attempt to counteract a spell like Mage Armor, but if you fail to counteract it, you can't even try again, ever. I think they either should have made it so it doesn't disappear, or 
it's on normal strikes, like normal hits, either only on crits, but never disappears, or on all successful hits, but can only be used once. One or the other, giving it both restrictions is really rough. Shared Replenishment is an awesome upgrade to Replenishment of War. Now, the half of your level temporary hit points you get on a strike can be granted to an ally within 10 feet instead of yourself. And you can do this multiple times per turn, which means if you and your rogue are flanking and you hit them once, you can grant your rogue temporary hit points. And if you manage to hit them a second time, you can grant them to yourself. This is some insane shielding, I guess I would call it. Really, it, no other class does anything like this, and I love it. I'm sad it doesn't come online until level 10 and higher, but I love this idea of a war priest who grants them and their allies effectively damage shields every single turn they hit. It's really, really cool. Now, Deity's Protection is a really solid feat. At level 14, if you cast a domain spell, effectively just a focus spell from your cleric domains, you gain resistance to all damage until the start of your next turn equal to the level of the spell you cast. And since domain spells are focus spells, spell focus spells will always be heightened to half your level. So at level 14, whenever you cast a focus spell, you gain resistance to all damage and reduce all damage taken by 7 for a full round. Not amazing, but not bad either. If only you could just have more focus points, this would be great. You can take Extend Align Armament, which makes it last a minute instead of a round. I guess, again, this is really cool if you're in, like, the Nine Hells just fighting demons, this could be cool. But it, this is one that, in the right campaign, is awesome. In a generic campaign where you don't know what you're fighting, not great. Fast Channel is phenomenal. And honestly, again, would have been nice to get earlier than level 14, but you can now use the three-action version of Heal or Harm by only spending two actions, but only the one associated with your font. So if you have a healing font, you can only do this with heal. If you have a harmful font, you can only do this with harm. But this is awesome, because now you can spend an action to move and position yourself, and then do the big emanation. Very nice. Swift Banishment is cool, but it kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth. This is the only time I've ever seen a feat that requires a specific spell. Swift Banishment only does something if you have prepared the Banishment spell. And as a reaction, should you critically hit a target, you can immediately spend the Banishment spell slot. But it's not like it automatically works. The creature still gets a saving throw against it, even though you already critically hit with your melee strike. So this is really, really... I feel like the word specific keeps coming up with all these cleric feats, but it is. It's specific, and it's really hard to get to work. You know, you have to critically hit, and they have to fail their saving throw when you could have just stood back and cast Banishment from a distance. I don't really see the point of this one. Ebb and Flow is really, really cool meta magic. You need to have the versatile font feat, but if you are to use a heal or harm spell on a target, then you can pick one target that it could heal and one target that it could hurt. For example, if you're using the two-action version of heal, you can target your fighter to restore hit points, and then you can target an undead to take damage, and it does both at the same time. This is an amazing action economy feat, if you can make it work in the right circumstances. A great way to do this is if you have a Dampier in your party. This means whenever you cast harm to heal your Dampier with their negative healing, you can just hurt any living creature at the same time. Fantastic. Premonition of Clarity. Once per hour as a reaction, if you fail a mental saving throw effect, you can reroll it with plus two. Is it good? Yeah. Should it be level 14? Probably not. Eternal Bane is honestly really cool for an evil war priest. You permanently have the Bane spell, which for those of you who don't know, it is the opposite of the Bless spell. This just inflicts a minus one to all enemy attack rolls, and this is permanently around you at a 15-foot radius. It can never be changed in radius, and you can dismiss it. This is crazy cool. On the flip side, we have Eternal Blessing, which is the same thing, but with a permanent Bless you and all allies within 15 feet of you just get a permanent plus one status bonus to attack rolls. That's phenomenal. Resurrectionist is actually insane. Should you bring a creature back from the dying condition by restoring hit points, they gain fast healing five for one minute. Fast healing is at the start of each of your turns, you gain hit points equal to the value. So they gain five hit points every turn for 10 rounds. Even if you're not in combat, this is a free 60 hit point heal for no extra resource spent. 
at the end of a combat, your fighter's down at zero and dying, but the combat's over, you spend a level one heal spell. You heal, you know, 1d8 plus whatever, and then they just get 60 hit points back over the course of a minute. This is incredible. Remediate is weird and situational. It's a free action meta magic, which is great. You know, you don't need to spend an action to use this. Uh, but if your following action is a three action heal or harm spell, you can attempt to counteract one opposing spell effect within that emanation. Now, the spell effect must directly oppose your deity. So if you're lawful good, when you use your three action heal spell, you can attempt to counteract either an evil or a chaotic spell effect, which are pretty rare, not gonna lie. Like, just to clarify, this isn't a spell effect caused by a chaotic or evil character. This is a spell with the chaotic or evil trait. So if the Necromancer just has Mage Armor active, this can't counteract that. It can only counteract something like Abyssal Plague because it has the evil trait. Level 18, you can get three focus points back instead of two. Echoing Channel is like ebb and flow, but way less cool and less good and should not be a level 18 feat. For one action, you imbue your next two action heal spell or harm spell. You can choose any creature directly adjacent to your target and affect it with the one action version of the spell instead. Now this isn't bad, this is still sort of a second spell using only one spell slot, but this means, you know, if you heal your ally with your level 9 heal spell, they heal for, you know, 98 plus, what, 72? They heal 98 plus 72, and then an ally adjacent to them heals for 98. It is good, and honestly, you know, if you're harming something, then, you know, you can harm one target for 98, and then their neighbor takes 90. Okay, the more I talk about this, the better it gets. Especially because, you know, for harm, harm doesn't get the bonus hit points on two actions. That's, that's actually pretty good. Alright, never mind. Echoing Channel's great. It doubles your healing and doubles your damage. It's pretty nuts. <laughs> Improved Swift Banishment is a little better than Swift Banishment. Uh, you no longer need to have Banishment prepared specifically. You just need to have a level 5 or higher spell slot. When you hit the target, you can just spend any of your spell slots, and it counts as casting Banishment of that level. You also inflict a minus 2 penalty to the target's saving throw against the Banishment spell. Now, this is nice. The minus 2 penalty is huge. I just think that should have been on the base Swift Banishment spell to give it a reason to exist. Because remember, you can still only do this on a critical hit. And you're level 18 with expert weapon proficiency, so it's nat 20 or bust, dude. Miraculous Possibility is okay. You take one of your spell slots of your highest level, and rather than filling it with a specific spell, you fill it with Divine Possibility. This lets you basically work like a sorcerer and spontaneously cast any spell you know with that spell slot, but the spell must be two or more levels below the prepared spell slot this way. So you're level 18, you prepare a ninth level spell slot, and you can cast any 7th level or lower spell you know at any time. The fluidity is nice, it's just unfortunate that it has to be so much lower level. Shared Clarity lets you use Premonition of Clarity on all of your allies within 15 feet. You and all allies within 15 feet, if they fail a mental saving throw, can re-roll at plus 2. Pretty, pretty good. You know, if you're fighting a Mind Flayer, this is going to come in clutch. Finally, we got some level 20 feats here, starting with Avatar's Audience. This does a couple of things. The first one, not necessarily always being positive. Any creature you encounter intrinsically knows you speak for your deity. Which means if you and your party need to sneak into a Rovagug party to do some recon, and you have this feat, anybody you talk to automatically knows you work for Sarenrae. Now the second effect is great. If you ever use a commune ritual, you don't need to pay its cost, and you automatically crit succeed, so you can just talk to your deity at any time. And the third one, which is just fantastic, allows you to warp to your deity's domain once per day with plane shift for free. And you can also return back to your home plane for one action at any time. And you can appear right where you need to be in your deity's plane of existence. So again, similar to the commune ritual, you can just be like, Yo, what up, Saren? Ray? How's it hanging, girl? Yo, I just need some help from you. Can I see you tomorrow? Okay, cool. Back to your home plane. Simple as that. Crazy good. Maker of Miracles, an extra 10th level spell slot per day. Metamagic channel I have an inherent problem with. Because this feat 
sort of makes the archetype work. You know, all of these meta magics that affect your heal and harm spells, well, for the most part, it's going to take three actions to activate the meta magic and then cast it two actions to have a range. Meta magic channel finally lets you use the meta magic as a free action instead of spending one action. It's great, but it's unfortunate that this is the feat that makes that archetype work. You know, now with this feat, you can take a move action, meta magic, and cast your healing spell. You know, that's great, but why is this level 20? I guess it's effectively the, the, the quickened level 20 feat that a lot of other classes get, but this is still... Oh, it feels too required to make the most use out of that meta magic. My issue with that whole build is that it's three actions. You know, in order to do anything, you need to have already been in the right place. If you don't happen to be positioned correctly from last round, you can't really use your meta magic and your heal spell if they're 35 feet away. You can't move. So it's unfortunate, you know? That was a really negative video. I love clerics, and I think I don't have a big issue with their feats being weak because I love their spell list. My big issue is very similar to the champion. There's a lot of restrictions with these feats and a lot of specificity, and they just need to be used in very specific circumstances, otherwise they do nothing. So I think clerics will benefit a lot from archetypes, I think. There's a lot of dead levels of feats and a lot of good levels which have multiple feats they want to take, so I guess it's not a big deal, you know? There's multiple level 8 and level 10 feats they want, so I guess at level 12 and 14 they can just take more level 8 feats, because, I don't know, I feel like there were very few feats in there I was like, yes, this is a phenomenal feat, and there was a lot of bleh. Which, if you look back at my swashbuckler video, where I was super gung-ho about every feat, I don't know, this is a very different experience. Again, I think a reason their feats are weaker is because they have access to magic. And especially, divine spells are strong. Divine spells, especially at high levels, do crazy amounts of healing and crazy amounts of effects. So, aside from augmenting the heal and harm spells, they get a few things that augment their combat capabilities. But for the most part, they're very flavorful feats to just tweak your character a little bit in different directions. But I want to hear what you guys think. Are you going to play a cleric? Do you love a cleric? Is there something I missed here? Am I under I obviously I misunderstood something. These deep dives are always one long take with no real preparation, so I inevitably misunderstand something. So maybe some of these feats are stronger. Maybe some are weaker than I gave them credit for. I want to hear from you guys down in the comments. So that is all from me. I want to give a huge shout out to my patrons for supporting me. I repeat myself every video, but you guys are fantastic. If you would like to become a patron, there is a link down in the description where you can support me financially for as little as $5 a month. You can also see that I'm doing character commissions for Pathfinder 2e characters. If you want a character made by me to your specifications, there is a link to my coffee commissions right in the description as well where you can get that made for you. So thank you all so very much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, no, not one.